Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. ESCOM and Public Enterprises Minister Praveen Gordon gave an update this week on the state of the system and the utilities finances. Terence Screamer went to the briefing at the Letabo power station and joins me to talk about some of the key messages emerging. Hi Terence. Oh, no. What is ESCOM saying about the prospect for load shedding over the coming winter months? I think the overall message is that we've returned to some sort of semblance of stability after 10 days of confidence sapping load shedding in March when we actually reached very high levels of load shedding. It was at the over 4,000 megawatts being cut rotationally around the country for several days because the, uh, mostly because of the underperformance of the coal plant. At one stage there was over 13,000 megawatts of coal uh, an unplanned outage and if you add <coughs> the planned outages because summer is usually when Eskom does most of its maintenance there wasn't really a lot left and they had to resort to to the power cuts which we know causes a lot of anxiety amongst re uh, individual citizens but especially in business it's really very uh, uh, growth eroding and confidence sapping so the, the picture going forward into winter as usual, I think we must look back. Uh, generally, winter isn't the period when Eskom does a lot of load shedding because it usually curtails its maintenance. The difference this year is that they're wanting to have fairly high levels of maintenance throughout winter. That means that the rest of the plant can't go into the high levels of breakdowns, but they have given themselves a bit of a margin in terms of how much maintenance they will be doing between 3,000 and 5,000 megawatts. So I think if there, is, uh, if there are signs that the system is under stress, I think they'll do less planned maintenance so as to cater for the breakdowns. They've also indicated that uh, t uh, two units, one from Kusile, one from Badupi, will be going into full commercial operation during the period. There may be uh, synchronization of another Kusile unit. And obviously they'll get some more capacity back from Kohorabasa and they'll look at using different levers such as uh, leaning on the energy intensive users and getting maybe 500 megawatts there of some sort of demand market participation, incentivizing those users to re reduce their demand. Um, and obviously they, they've also been paying attention to that issue of diesel management, which I think uh, was, a, was a key issue during the recent spate of uh, load shedding where they basically ran down their diesel stocks and therefore couldn't use the very expensive but stabilizing open cycle gas turbines. So I think the message is <coughs> that unless there's a number of unforeseen events and if they can keep uh, unplanned outages to no more than 9,500 megawatts, then they should get through winter without having to cut. And uh, they are suggesting that the worst case scenario is 26 days during this winter period, which lasts from around the beginning of May until August. During that period, there could be 26 days where the system's going to be tight and vulnerable because they're doing their forecasting ahead. And, uh, but they are saying if there is load shedding, or the minister, Praveen Gordon, is saying if there is load shedding, it'll be at a sort of stage one level, which is 1,000 megawatts of cuts. So it's really, uh, the, the message is things are a lot more stable than they were in March. Um, uh, but there is still obviously a risk of us descending into some form of uh, load shedding if things don't go as planned. The technical review team also provided some insight into where opportunities exist for improving stability. Yes, I think this team's you know, it's just really started its work in early March. It's an independent group, mostly engineers, some of whom have worked at Eskin before and they're going around to the different power stations and to the power projects and trying to understand what are the problems. I, I don't think they've come up with anything massively new, but I think they've done some uh, sort of independent analysis of what Eskom is saying are the problems and have stress tested those. And I think, uh, th I think the key message coming from them is this is really a people issue, that uh, if you have the right leadership in place at the power station and you have full critical technical vacancies, which is easier said than done, then you can recover the coal power stations to a, a much more stable level. And it's in those areas where there isn't that permanent power station manager in place or vacancies uh, in key technical areas where we're seeing a lot of this, the problems. 
And then also they've looked through the technical issues, for instance, boiler tube leaks, uh, issues around the, uh, fans that are, uh, that are leading to sort of lower levels of output than should be the case if the, the plant was operating uh, a, a sort of a nameplate capacity and sort of identifying maybe some quick wins. So I think the, the, big, the big message is that actually this is a people issue and uh, Eskom needs to really give those power stations both the sort of permanent appointments as well as uh, uh, to fill those key technical vacancies and then we can see a recovery. They're saying at some of the plants we can get back eventually to an energy availability factor of 80%. They say already some of the plants are already at that level. Uh, I have my doubts that the whole fleet can get back to that level given the underspending on maintenance. So I think there will be definite power stations that will operate at that, that sort of targeted level. But I think across the board, if we take all the units, including the ones that are really struggling at some of the older power station, I don't think 80% is a realistic goal. Uh, but maybe it is a realistic goal for a small cohort in the fleet. A dire picture was painted about the state of ESCOM's finances. Yes, I think that was the other message which was really teased out by the media during the, the media conference. And uh, just to understand where does Eskom stand after uh, having received this 13.8% tariff increase from NERSA, having received a 23 billion rand a year for three years at least, e equity injection from its shareholder or, in some, or some form of injection from the shareholder, uh, as well as some of the, the RCA uh, regulatory clearing account relief that NERSA has granted as, as well. And the picture after that is actually, as you say, dire. Um, the gap that Chairman Jabba Mabuza is talking about now is 250 billion rand. Uh, he doesn't put a time frame to that, but uh, generally they work within these, the, the three-year horizon, but it might be longer than that. But it's a 250 billion rand hole that they're still in after getting the additional tariffs after getting the equity injection and after the RCAs. So this is a real country problem. We know that the consumers at a point where they, we can't, uh, very many sectors can't bear uh, more steep tariff hikes. We've already heard from the gold and platinum sectors, 90,000 jobs even under the current scenario are now in jeopardy. And I think, uh, you know, if you go across the energy intensive uh, industries of South Africa, you'll find a fairly similar job uh, picture. So the consumers at sort of the end of where they can bear. The bondholder is nervous about Eskom uh, in the sense that, you know, can they get their money back? Um, really Eskom's officially got 420 billion rands worth of domestic and foreign debt. And uh, it's unclear with the tariffs how they're going to be able to repay it. And uh, there are cost compression measures being taken by Eskom at last. And they are talking about taking out 20 billion rands worth of cost over the next um, three years. But that's really not going to be sufficient to close this 250 billion rand hole. So I think there's going to have to be a um, coming together of leading minds, financiers, the government, the shareholder, um, as well as Eskom to try and look at different funding models and different models for Eskom going forward. We already know that the Eskom Sustainability Task Team has proposed the unbundling um, of Eskom into three different units. And then maybe once there's visibility, once they are separated, there may be better visibility of how maybe private or uh, outside partners can inject either uh, some sort of financial resources. But it's very clear that it's going to be constrained by the, the no privatization narrative. And uh, so they might be a strategic equity partner, but that will only be up to a point. And I think the minister, Pravin Gordon, said that point would be below control, so below 49%. So, and also we're asking people to invest in a highly indebted and fairly unsustainable enterprise. So it's going to be interesting when the Eskom Sustainability Task Team eventually publishes its report at the end of ab April, what sort of financing mechanisms are included in that plan. Uh, uh, Professor Anton Eberhardt, who leads that team, indicated they're looking at a number of models 
uh, blended finance facilities, whatever that might mean, concessionary finance, which is usually development finance. But it's really unclear at this stage how Eskom is going to close over the coming years the 450 billion gap without a major change to its structure and a major change to its costs and a major change to its prospects of earning the revenue that it, that it needs to earn the, uh, the profit that it can get to pay back and service its very, very big debt. Currently, as I say, officially at 420 billion rand, pr probably quite a lot north of that, given that that, was, that figure was put out quite a few months ago. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News daily email newsletter.